Well, we're doing a series for the month of July. It just happened to have five Sundays, so I figured, well, this might be a good time to review our, what are called our five basic unity principles. So this is the fourth Sunday, which means we're on principle number three. Uh, <laughs> just making sure you're listening. <laughs> principle number four, which is all about prayer. And it was originally written like this. Prayer is creative thinking that heightens the connection with God mind and therefore brings forth wisdom, healing, prosperity, and everything good. I can tell you, I grew up with a much different definition of prayer. I went to Catholic schools just about all my life, so when I saw this definition, the way that unity defined prayer, it was a pretty radical departure from the tradition that I was used to, and it was one of the things that drew me in to unity. Uh, and just to give you an idea of, of how radical this concept is, this is what Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore once wrote on the subject of prayer. He said, understanding shows that prayer is more than asking God for help in this physical world. Actually, we have become a human race of praying beggars. Prayer is not supplication or begging. I like that line, a human race of praying beggars. Don't beat around the bush, Charles. Tell us what you really think about the subject. So he probably wrote that, uh, oh, it could have been back in the 20s. Um, but one of the, the best contemporary essays on prayer can be found in Chapter 9 of the book Discover the Power Within You by Unity Minister Eric Butterworth. Eric says that prayer has no absolute meaning in this day and age. And I think he's right about that, because if we look at the way that the word prayer is used by people today, all the different ways that it's used, we can come up with about six different categories. Here they are. There are prayers of petition, which is basically begging for ourselves. There are prayers of intercession, begging for other people. Prayers of praise, which is trying to flatter God. Prayers of thanksgiving, which I think <clears throat> needs no ex explanation. Uh, affirmative prayer, prayers of affirmation, which is the way we do it in unity. And then there's meditation, which is beyond our focus today, but I think is really the foundation for it all. And we know what these are. These should be pretty familiar to us because I think we've probably done all of them at different times in our lives. So, Let's take a look at uh, some of these in a little more, little more detail. Prayers of petition. That's when we want something, usually for ourselves. It's, it's kind of like we've made up a wish list, and we're presenting it to a God out there, and it can cover everything from, you name it, healing, prosperity, a new car, give me, help me, show me, that kind of a thing. Now the next category, prayers of intercession, they tend to be directed outward. We want something to happen in the outer world or we want something to happen for another person. It's another kind of a wish list, but this time we want this God out there to do something for someone else. Heal someone, change the weather, help one side, win a war, or a baseball game for that matter. Um, <laughs> A lot of people think that God is a sports fan, right? A lot of people think that God is a sports fan. And um, if that's the case, I would say that the Giants are going to need all the help they can get this year. It's, it's not looking good. But, um, yeah, so it's prayer for a supernatural intervention in the world, even to the extent of wanting there to be a suspension of the laws of physics for some reason. That's prayers of intercession. Then we have prayers of praise, and there's a couple of different ways of looking at this. Uh, sometimes the prayer of praise is a form of flattery. And when we do that, we're casting God as a bit of a, a narcissist, right? Yeah. Like we have to make God, 
this, the all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, and so on, we have to make God feel good by saying nice things. Can you imagine a more codependent relationship? This idea that, that, that we want God to feel good. So, to put it mildly, it's a rather limited way of looking at things. But on the other hand, there's another way of looking at it. A prayer of praise can be a, a, a spontaneous reaction or a spontaneous response to a transcendent experience. And it doesn't have to involve a lot of flowery words. It doesn't even have to involve words at all. I can remember the first time I saw this view here. And I know most of you have probably seen this view as well. It's the tunnel view going into Yosemite. And I remember coming there and pulling into the parking area and getting out of the car and looking out over this for the very first time that I was there. And I uttered the sacred holy words, holy. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in the blank. Smoke. It's holy smoke, thank you. We hope, we hope not, but there's some smoke there right now, isn't there? Yeah, fortunately it was, it was a clear day that day. Um, but yeah, the word could, it could be wow, or it could even be stunned silence. It's all a matter of what's going on in consciousness. When you experience the abundant, diverse beauty of reality, it's, it's hard to put that appreciation into words sometimes, words that make really any sense. So that kind of prayer, that spontaneous expression of, of awe and wonder is very closely related to the next form of prayer, which is thanksgiving, or another way of putting it is gratitude. Yeah. There was a great uh, 13th century theologian and mystic, you might have heard of, Meister Eckhart. One of my favorite quotes from him is about gratitude or thanksgiving. He said this, if the only prayer you ever say in your whole life is thank you, that would suffice. He's right. He's right. A prayer of gratitude is simple, sufficient, it's affirmative, and it's complete. And that brings us then to the fifth kind of prayer we're going to talk about today, which is affirmative prayer, which is what we do in unity. That's how our chaplains are trained. That's how our ministers are trained. When we talk about prayer, you usually hear, it, you hear someone talking about affirmative prayer. Affirmative prayer is very careful in not seeking to change something, being very careful about that. Yes, I know, we, always, we, we often want conditions to change, but we want to be careful about what we're really doing when we ask for outer conditions to change. We want to be very careful because sometimes when we are asking for <coughs> outer conditions to change, we are implicitly saying that there's something lacking in the way things are right now. That's what we want to be careful about. For example, if we are praying for money or praying for prosperity out of a pattern of thinking which is saying, I don't have enough, what we're really doing is affirming lack. If we're begging God to heal us, we have to be careful that we're not affirming something negative. We don't want to affirm that the way to wholeness is outside of us. We want to be careful that we don't separate ourselves from the reality of health and healing. Yes, we all need a little help from our friends, from our doctors, from outside of us, but the source of health, healing, and wholeness starts within. Prayer is consciousness conditioning. That's the other definition that we use in unity that uh, I really found to be very compelling. Prayer is consciousness conditioning, and what we change with prayer is one thing and one thing only, our own state of consciousness. So what we want to do in this process of consciousness, con consciousness conditioning, consciousness conditioning, that's harder to say than I thought, uh, we want to condition our consciousness with realized truth not error thinking. Realize truth, not error thinking. Eric Butterworth once again tells us that affirmative prayer is a form of asking, but it's not like giving a wish list to God. Here's what he says. He says, you ask for your good in the sense of claiming 
your inheritance. A good worker who comes in early and leaves late, who always tries to improve his performance and help the company, is asking for a promotion by affirmative behavior, right? And it usually comes because he has created conditions that make that result inevitable. You ask for life by affirming life. You ask for success by getting in the consciousness of success. The purpose of prayer then is to affirm in our consciousness that which is true of God and of our relationship with God. That's a good little paragraph there. And substitute for God as you see fit. I happen to like the word principle, but maybe in this context I would expand on that and call it reality. The purpose of prayer then is to affirm in our consciousness that which is true of reality and our relationship with reality. We always want to live in right relationship with reality because doing otherwise creates and invites suffering. I think it was Byron Katie who once said that um, when I argue with reality, I lose, but only 100% of the time, right? <laughs> Heard that one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pray all you want, but you're not going to suspend the law of gravity. Time will not go backwards. Entropy does not decrease. And then we come to the thorny issue of praying for others, especially when they don't know that you're praying for them. What good does it do? Well, obviously, if it's someone you know, someone who's close to you, you're concerned for their well-being for whatever reason, praying for them is actually helping you to transform and release any kind of stress that might be related to your concern for others. You know, there's a very, there's a very thin line between concern and worry, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> and when someone asks for your prayer support and you agree to do that for them, they know they're not on their own, they're not on their own and in facing whatever the situation happens to be, that knowledge alone is a source of inner peace. We don't have to fix anything. We don't have to promise to fix anything. We cannot and should not guarantee a particular result. What we can always do is to affirm with the person and in consciousness that any condition can change for the better, and then if there's an action step that can make that even more likely, then we're going to discern what that is and follow through. We're going to be in a better position to discern what that is and follow through. They will be in a better position to discern what that is and follow through. We can always affirm with them in consciousness that anything can change. One of the things we used to do... Um, at Silent Unity, that's uh, Unity's 24-7 um, prayer ministry that's at Unity World Headquarters back in uh, Kansas City. Karen and I worked there, I think for about a year when we were in school. And during the training that we went through and then subsequently working in the prayer room, I remember one phrase in particular that they taught us that I would try to use with just about every caller whenever it was appropriate or relevant to the, to the, to the topic, to the request. A very simple phrase. We release any worry or concern and choose to trust knowing that the right and perfect outcome is unfolding now. That's it. We release any worry or concern and choose to trust knowing that the right and perfect outcome is unfolding now. And it's amazing how powerful that is. It's almost like Saying those words, you almost feel the stress kind of draining out of your body, and that's a good, good thing, whether it's for the person praying 
or for the person that you're praying with. It's a wonderful affirmation. Releasing worry and anxiety calms the mind and helps us to helps us to gently expand our awareness. When we're when we're locked in anxiety, fear, and stress, it's almost like we have tunnel vision, right? Everything is pinched and clenched up, but when we release that worry and concern, we've expanded our awareness. We become open to things that we that we might have missed. And of course the simple act of relaxation can aid in physical healing. A lot of the medications that we take aren't quite as effective when we're stressed out and releasing a lot of cortisol and other stuff into the bloodstream. So the relaxation response is healing. But again, what if we're being asked to do that for a third party who is not physically present and doesn't even know that we're praying or affirming anything? Well, there have been some well-organized studies which has shown that praying for someone who doesn't know that they're being prayed for doesn't seem to have much of an effect on them. And I'll tell you, I think that's probably as it should be. Because who am I to try to change the course of someone's life without their permission or knowledge? We always assume that our intentions are benevolent. We want to help, not harm. But if it's possible to help someone who doesn't know it through some sort of mental effort like prayer, why wouldn't it also be just as possible to harm them as well? Be careful what you wish for, as they say. If it's possible to heal that way, then is it not also possible to do harm? And I don't think we really want that to be true if we consider it deeply. You know, during her lifetime, our co-founder Myrtle Fillmore received many, many letters from people asking for her advice, for her counsel, for her prayer support, and I think she personally responded to just about all of them. And what they did with those letters was that they made them into a book, which is appropriately called Healing Letters. And in one of those letters that she wrote to a person, she was responding to someone who was asking for advice about how to intervene for a third party using prayer. This was Myrtle Fillmore's response. She said, We are asking you to place him confidently in the care and keeping of his indwelling Lord and to take your mental hands off. <laughs> Don't treat him. In other words, she's advising this person to trust, to get in that consciousness of trust, to release worry and concern, and know that this person already has everything that is needed to deal with whatever the situation might happen to be. So we don't try to meddle remotely or anonymously. And here's the other part of it. Because sometimes when I, when I give this talk or when I talk to people about the subject, I get, the, I get the, uh, the, the response, well, then why bother? Let's not pray for people that don't know we're praying for them. No, that's not it at all. We don't try to meddle remotely and anonymously, and we don't ignore them or the situation. That's the balance we're trying to strike. And we take it back to truth and principle. And if there is some kind of action that we can reasonably take, then we do that as well. We hear about natural disasters in the world. The call goes out for prayer. And of course today with Facebook and Twitter, we see all these little posts go up. Thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Good but they're no substitute for action. Do both, if possible. I know it's hard. If there's a disaster around on the other side of the world, you can't just pick up stakes and go there and try to rescue people. Maybe you can donate money to a, to a trustworthy relief effort. Do both, if possible. But if there's an earthquake on the other side of the world, we're not going to fix anything by thinking about it. If we can donate to that relief agency, yes. And then we still want to remember our thoughts and prayers because again we're engaging in a consciousness conditioning project when the call goes out 
for prayer after some disaster, whatever it is, it's really a spontaneous request for our empathy and our compassion. That's the request that's being made. A call for prayer is an invitation for the human community to join in an awareness of the reality of suffering and to put our focus on the means we've been given to overcome that suffering, even if we don't know what it is at the moment. And we can respond again in a couple of ways. One way is to look away, avert our eyes, go looking for more distractions. Or, even if we can't physically intervene, we respond to the call of empathy and compassion by saying, yes, I see you, I hear you, I won't look away or ignore you. Even on the other side of the world, if that's the way it happens to be, I acknowledge your humanity, I acknowledge your pain, I acknowledge your suffering, and I recognize that this is really closer to me than I realize because we're all part of the same tribe on planet Earth. I want the same for you that I want for myself, even if I don't know exactly how to make that happen. We don't have to know. We don't have to promise to fix anything. We don't have to make any guarantees. We just need to use that situation and answer the call so that, at the very least, we show up in the world as more empathetic and compassionate human beings who are willing to look, promising not to look away, and then we spread that example out into the rest of the world, and that's how we change things. That's how prayer works in unity. See you next week. Thank you.